Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Lynn O'Hara. I'm the director of programs at the NHD National Office, which is kind of this giant job. But if you could just do me a favor, a couple things for this session. We're going to be talking to each other. I can't sit and talk at you for an hour. I want to get you engaged. But I'd love to hear just quickly what your name is, what grade or grade levels you teach, and something fun about the students you teach. Because that helps me gear and give different examples. So I'm going to start over here. <laughs> Excellent. Get, one of the things I think is really cool about History Day is that for a lot of students, it gets them on a college campus for the first time. Yeah. Whether it's to a library or a regional contest or a state contest. As a kid who my dad graduated from college, my mom didn't quite finish. That first time I stepped foot on a college campus was as an eighth grader for a regional history day. And that can be really powerful for kids, especially kids who don't get that experience or opportunity otherwise. Excellent. Thank you, Angela. I hope we haven't scared you off so far. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it sounds scarier than, it's very easy when you start this idea of history day to get completely overwhelmed yeah. because it seems scary. If you really think about it though, it's a project. It's a long-term project. And I always really stress to teachers that you are in charge of this project. That Contest rule book is the rule book for a contest, not the rules for your classroom. So keep that and throw other ideas out as we go. And that idea of one step at a time. Don't try to look at the end product. Like I never, when I do teacher workshops, I, we have examples of like, you know, top 10 national winners on our website and I never use them. Because number one, no project even starts off like that, even the ones that end like that. And I don't show it with kids because I think it scares them. It intimidates them. And that's not the point. The point is to say, let's start where you are, Let's push you and let's push you to see the next step. And honestly, whether you're looking at this from a teacher or a student perspective, it's one step at a time. Because if you try to leap to the end, it doesn't work. And it crashes and burns and then nobody wants to come back and do it again. So we're going to give you kind of some tools and some steps to help you and some tools to use with your students in this session and then my later session. Well, I think what I'm going to do in this session is really focus on two of those essential skills because I can do like this for five days straight. But I think these are two really key skills with research questions and thesis statements. And I think these are two skills that set up a really good project. A um, couple things. I have like the craziest, coolest job in the world in that I always tell people I was a History Day student and I was a History Day teacher. So I have been blessed to really see this program from all different angles. I live outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I work with teachers literally all over the world. One of my favorite things to do is to get out in the field and to work with programs and work with our affiliate coordinators. I'm going to Singapore next week, which is totally wild in my book. Um, and I also lead all other kinds of teacher programs. We have our online classes and virtual programs and theme webinars and different activities to really engage different people and engage different um, groups of people within the History Day Network. My primary target audience of a lot of my materials is our teachers. Um, I actually work in a lot of ways very little with our contest. We have an amazing contest team that runs the program in College Park in June, but then also a lot of the things that go out through our affiliate coordinators and our regional coordinators. But my focus is more on the teaching of it and building the skills. Because one thing that I find, especially, and I think this is really true, especially if you work with gifted kids, that they, we assume that they know more than they do. Because just because a kid's smart, doesn't necessarily mean that they have the skill base. And that might be an academic skill base, that might be a social <coughs> skill base, that might be a research skill base. And I think sometimes when our we try something and it doesn't work, we think it's because the kids can't do it. And I think we have to restructure that to say, hey, have we taught the students to do what we're asking them to do? And if not, we've got to reframe how we teach it. Because I think the key to a good History Day project is starting up with a good question. Now, the worst History Day projects of all time, and I wrote one of these papers in eighth grade, are Wikipedia projects, right? Uh -huh. Turn to your neighbor, worst project you've ever seen, History Day or not in your classroom, and what made it so bad? Go. <laughs> all right, so recap for me. The worst projects have what elements in common? And don't, right, first off, don't feel shameful about a bad project. Because if you haven't been doing History Day, and you haven't gotten at least one bomb of a project each year, <laughs> you are not offering this to a wide enough audience. And I don't care what level you're working. I've had bombs in AP US history and I've had bombs in COTOT, but I think there's value to that anyway. So what are some of the elements of really bad projects? Lack of follow through. Lack of follow through, like it got started but not finished. Lack of research. You mean you have to research? <laughs> exactly. What else? What else makes it bad? The topic stays too general. Yes, we're gonna do all of bad. World War II, right? 
Uh, no, that's not going to work. For the wrong topic for the thing. And they're trying to force that, and it's not going to happen. They throw the word in there. Barrier, triumph, and tragedy. I read a paper that had, I forget what the theme was, I think it was conflict and compromise, and one of those words appeared in every single sentence of the paper. Like, it was awful. <laughs> Absolutely. I am sure what the student was trying to do, and it impressed some judge somewhere, but it wasn't a very good paper in the end. What other elements make students struggle with a project like this? Not knowing, yeah. I'm sorry, say it again? Not knowing the steps to do the project. Mm -hmm. Trying to jump from the first step to the last step. What else? Um, I think not having the not understanding the importance of having a variety of sources, the importance of having primary sources, <laughs> um, and how to interpret those sources um, to kind of show analysis, etc. I mean, it's it is difficult. I mean, mm -hmm. even for us to do that, it's hard. So I think that's difficult for them to do it. So trying to find them and then figuring out what to do with them once they have them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they just miss a boat. Like I remember I had a student working on a Louisiana purchase project and we got to like a stage and I said, do you have any maps? Yeah. And she just looked at me, I'm like, do you think maybe we should find some maps? <laughs> because this is kind of a map heavy project. Yeah. At some point you were gonna expect your final product to have some sort of a map in there. At the, you know, at, as a judge, especially at the local level, saw a lot of bias. So I think, you know, some students have a hard time, you know, being you know, unbiased with the topic, you know, and at, yeah, because they're passionate about the topic and they don't want to look, sometimes they don't, it's painful to look at, you know, the negative You stuff. get the fan projects. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is the greatest person who ever lived in history. Or students who get very caught up in kind of the good and evil aspects of history and really struggle to see that other perspective and that other side. And I'm actually going to give you an activity later this afternoon to help with perspective that you can throw in. Now, here's the key. The goal to get away from the really bad projects is to structure it. And the first way we structure it is by using the theme, right? This is a brand new theme for us. This actually was suggested by a teacher, which is one of the reasons I'm so excited about it. <laughs> but I think in order to get students thinking analytically, it's really important that we practice this every day. And Louisa made a reference to this. So what I'd like you to do, turn to your neighbor. Real quick, what did you teach yesterday? If it was a test day, go back a day or two. So think about what content you were teaching. And then talk about how you can integrate questions or activities about breaking barriers into what you are already doing. Go. All right, so who can give me an example of what you were teaching and what we can do? And we're going to throw out other ideas to that person. So who wants to start? Who hasn't talked yet? You can't hide in here. There's not. There's far too few people to hide in this room. I've done this with like 150 people. You can hide in that room. So who's going to What were you teaching this week? Um, Content-wise, what were you teaching? Because teaching? Um, I also do ELA, so I was teaching Ricky Tiki Tabi to my seventh graders. Okay. Talking with Scott, right? Um, about they're very much rural and ranch kids and farm kids and. Um, they're, they're not exposed to a lot of different cultures. Mm -hmm. And so even just bringing in um, the background for that story and having to explain, you know, where, you know, how people in India at the time were living in the gardens and things like that was, I mean, I don't know if it's breaking down a barrier, but introducing them to something they're not used to. Well, think about it from this perspective. What what skill you're really talking about is historical context. You've got to give them the context in order to understand the piece of literature. So in doing that, you're helping them show whether you're not necessarily directly addressing the theme, you're addressing one of the skills. And by showing them, hey, in order to understand this, what's our time? What's our place? What's going on? Who are these people? What group of people are we talking about? I mean, you've got political, economic, social, religious right there in setting context. Okay, what's another way? What else are you teaching this week? And what can we do to integrate either the theme or the skills into that? Well, I, I, well, I taught about Anne Hutchinson. So I, used, okay. right, I pulled right out of her story because it's an NHD class. And, you know, and that, but what I, you know, with doing that was trying to, you know, spur interest in, you know, in women's history projects, you know, that, that's, you know, a, uh, you know, and a lot of them didn't really even know that, you know, this was the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote. And so, 
Yeah. Well, she's a character. She's also in our her story book. If you don't have that, you should have that walking out of here today. Um, but the idea of using vignettes or examples. And I would say, I would encourage you to directly ask these kinds of questions frequently. Who was in? What's the barrier? What multiple types of barrier? Because there's religious issues going on. There's social issues. There's economic issues going on. There's also environmental issues. You've got to remember these people are living in the frontier of frontiers, far from home and anything that they understood from any kind of a context. And ask these questions regularly. Um, one year I was in the classroom, it was turning points. And I use that as a wrap up a whole bunch of days, literally just saying, turn to your partner. What was the turning point and why did it matter? And my students after a while would groan, but then they would turn to their neighbor and they'd talk about it. So you're talking about it all the time using whatever content it is you're teaching. Because you can't, I mean, unless you have an NHD class, you can't stop everything and just do NHD. But you can bring it in very easily. And when someone walks in to observe you, you can explain why you chose that question as your wrap up ticket or you know, as your exit ticket or your wrap up for the day because you're prepping them for what's coming whether they're already started on it or haven't even gotten there yet. What else? Uh, one thing I would do when I taught U.S. history is um, bring in the theme. I would, it, it could either be the chapter or maybe even just when introducing it, have them go through the textbook and pick out examples of what they would, you know, because also they're going to find stuff that they're obviously interested in, attracted mm -hmm. to, um, ideas that you would never think of. Um, so I think that's a great way to get them involved. Or even if you just do it chapter by chapter, like, okay, spend five minutes flipping through this chapter and come up with five examples of, of breaking barriers. And dig it up. You take chapter one, you take chapter two, you take chapter three. And then I usually keep all those ideas mm -hmm. on the wall until they choose their topics, just to start a list, basically, to kind of get them thinking about it. And a lot of these activities, we're not talking about hours-long activities. We're talking about 10 to 15 minutes. And I think if you can infuse those skills in little bits, practice them, try them, reinforce them, Put them up on the wall to go back to them the next week. Hey, so wait a second, we just talked about the Transcontinental Railroad. What were the barriers? Who were the barrier breakers? What are the ideas that ba break barriers when we talk about this topic? And another thing I've noticed is when you're kind of having that banter back and forth, like a 10 minute bell ringer, uh, they might say, okay, Martin Luther King, he broke a barrier. And just real quickly, well, what barrier did he break? And they'll tell you, well, why was it important? And they'll tell you. It's pretty, like, very direct. And in a way, I think it helps them verbalize it more, just being that direct and then being like, okay, well, now you need to prove that that's, that's what you're trying to prove. Mm -hmm. It kind of gets them to verbalize it easier because it's, it's just more natural, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? No, I think it absolutely does. And we have to practice it regularly in order for them to really ingrain it and be able to use it. Mm -hmm. So let's kind of talk about how I approach it. So a lot of students start with the topic. Some of your students kind of have time, they have a sense of where they think they want to go. But if you just throw them right into research, sometimes they kind of just kind of start gathering anything they can see, but they don't really know what to do with it. And this is where I think helping students frame a really good research question can help drive efficient research. So I like when I start with this, uh, I, I kind of looked at, okay, we're going to talk with students about what a research question is. I went to Duke University. By the way, their writing program has really good writing resources. It's designed for college students, but it's easily adaptable. And I'm going to share all this with you on Monday, so please don't think you have to copy this down or take pictures of every slide. Um, so what is a research question? And the people at Duke tell us that a research question guides and centers your research. It needs to be clear and focused, as well as synthesize multiple sources to create your, present your unique argument. The research question should ideally be about something you are interested in or care about. Be careful to avoid the all about paper and questions that can be answered in a few factual statements. So if that's what it is, how do we get kids to something like this, especially if you're working with these sixth and seventh graders? And the way that I started is with a very simple question. Why did the chicken cross the road? Mm -hmm. Now, I have to say, I took that to Idaho and they told me it was a rooster, not a chicken, but it's a chicken. And it has sneakers and you can find this stuff on Google Images. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, turn to your neighbor. Why did the chicken cross the road? Is that a good research question, a bad research question, or something in the middle, and why? Go. Alright, help me out. Is this a good research question? No. Why not? It's too broad. Who's the chicken? Why is that important? 
Where's Why does it matter? Where's the, Where's the road? Where's the road? This is very vague. And a lot of times when students start to draft a question, they start with like a chicken crossing the road question, right? It's a big general question. And our goal is going to get them to be more specific. And you know, they hit exactly those kinds of things. We don't know what we're talking about with this general question. So here's what I'm gonna have you do. I'm gonna have you write me a better chicken cross the road question. <laughs> You've got the topic. What would be a good research question about the chicken crossing the road? Talk about it in your groups, go. Try to draft something. And it has to deal with breaking barriers? Uh, not even yet, okay. we're just getting into chicken crossing the road. All right. So here's the key when you do this with students. The first question tends to be way too broad. About the cross the second of the version of the question sometimes gets to something like this. How many chickens crossed Broad Street in Philadelphia on January 1st, 2018? They go from way too broad to way too what? Specific. <laughs> way too specific, right? And let's be honest. If this chicken crossing the road incident happened, it's a fact. There's no room for argumentation. And it can be answered using a basic Google search. So the key is to find that sweet spot. We don't just want the factual answer. We need something that can be argued or discussed. All right, so I've got a bright room of intelligent teachers with bachelor's degrees, many of them have master's degrees, some might even have a PhD. Mm -hmm. So I wanna hear some awesome chicken, the chicken crossing the road questions. This is where we get not very brave. Mm -hmm. Come on, be brave, so, give it a shot. So we, we did, just, he started off, got really specific, and so I just kind of used some of that idea. So how did farmers get chickens across the road safely? Okay. Uh, what do we think of that question? I think it's still a simple answer because they built a crosswalk and put up a stop sign. Okay. I think it's still a simple answer. Well, well, limited the experience, but two broad. Which chickens? Where? Which farmers? Maybe it's more important. Um, you know, where are we in the world? And do we know why there's a problem? You see, we're trying to cross the road in the first place. Well, we we kind of So, what happened to um, chickens um, when the um, interstate highway system was put in and split ranches and farms where chickens had to cross from one side to the other. And they were used to crossing. How, how, now they get, they get yeah. cars and things like that, but okay. Now, here's, this is good. And what I want you to do with your students is workshop research questions like this. Have them throw up a question and then give feedback. We have to not teach our students to not be afraid to discuss and help each other. So who took a different approach to the chicken question? Go for it, Aaron. So if the rooster is crossing the road to promote highway safety, we're going to say 550 um, has an issue with drunk drivers on it. Okay. So then we maybe went into how successful was his campaign to end drunk driving on 550. Okay, so now we're talking about a specific place, a specific context, and a reason. Okay? Different approach. Different approach. What do you got up here? We put ours in an era. Okay. So how did, well, we're still working on it. How did the chicken crossing the Sel Selma Bridge during the civil rights era affect the civil rights movement? Okay. What, what do you think rights. of that question? I'll tell you what I think in a second, but what do you think of that question? Obviously, they're still playing with the wording a little bit. You would have to understand how the chicken was related to segregation. Yeah. If you're talking about Selma. And was it a black chicken or was it a white one? I mean, because it's a brown spotted one. Who knows, right? Yeah. He was protesting yeah. for chicken rights. There you go. <laughs> Here's what I like about this question. It's still a little unformed, but I like that it starts with how. Driving students to the how and the why starters, as opposed to the what or the who starters, can be really powerful. Taking a basic idea and just shifting it. So I'm going to give you my chicken question. Again, it's my fake incident. What are some of the environmental <coughs> factors that occurred in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in November and December 2017 that influenced the Great Chicken Crossing? 
of January 1st, 2018. <laughs> okay, obviously this is fake as all can get up, but what am I doing here with this research question? You're basically giving a, a synopsis or a statement of what the things you're going to cover in your, your project. You're going to environmental factors, where, specifically what, you know, years and months, and you're going to talk about chickens. Mm -hmm. So... I'm focusing the question, right? I'm not talking about the political reasons why they went across the road. I'm gonna focus on environmental. I've narrowed my parameters. And that's really key for students because they wanna look at everything. But in order to have a really good research question, it has to be manageable. It has to be manageable in scope so that you can legitimately answer the research question. So by choosing, hey, I'm gonna focus on the environmental piece. Not the military piece, not the political piece. I don't know what that chicken's running from, what the social piece or the religious piece. I'm, I'm, uh, this is what I'm focusing on. This is my location. This is my time frame. And this is the event. Take this idea, turn to your neighbor, revise your chicken question a little bit. What kind of tweaks might you make? To this question? Well, to yours. This is what I did with mine, but what would you do with yours based on that conversation? For an NHD question, we really don't have enough context yet um, to um, see how the Great Chicken Crossing of January 1st, 2018 really, um, you know, affected. Well, and that's where the timing comes in. Your students have to start a little research first. They have to understand the basics of the event then really settle on that question. Because if they try to write the question when all they have is Brown versus the Board of Education, they don't know enough to do this. They almost need like two to three weeks of research under their belt. And then I would come at them. And the reason is, is that once they start to narrow down and figure out, that's gonna help direct the research. Because then you're gonna say, you know what, this book that you thought was really, really helpful in the beginning, does it answer that question? And if they say yes, you keep it. And if they say no, what do you tell them to do? Get rid of it. And delete it from their bibliography. And they hate that. <laughs> Students hate to do that. But sometimes you've got to throw out the trash too to say, you know what, this wasn't helpful. This is just another encyclopedia article. Question. Do you, do you uh, along that lines of what you just said, do students ever come up with dead ends? Like they have to change their um, whole concepts because they come up with nothing? I, I've had to do I that in other once. Okay. Oftentimes what I found is that when students are hitting those dead ends, that's where those one-on-one -on -one coaching conversations come in. And oftentimes if they've really hit a dead end, one of two things has to happen. Either they need to broaden it out, which is usually the feasible answer, or they need to narrow down. I'd say it's about 80% broaden out, 20% narrow down. Um, the one project that I just could not figure out how to make work for a student is I had a student who was a big football fan. And during World War II in Pennsylvania, the Steelers from Pittsburgh and the Eagles from Philadelphia combined into one team called the Steagles. Oh, how cool. And she was really interested in that. And we simply could not find the sources. And I said, you know, we, we did a lot and we tried. And I said, you know, I think we really have to shift this to a different sports history topic. And once we did that, she was fine. And you do hit that, but oftentimes it means they're trying to get too narrow. And this is a good point, two to three weeks into research, to help know if your students are on track, if they can craft something solid, and if they can't. This is one of these activities where, I, what I would tend to do is I had History Day Fridays in my class. That's when we would work on projects. So I would have students play with this in class, maybe like Tuesday or Wednesday of that week. Turn me in your questions. And that would give me time to read them and comment them. I kind of sort them into three piles. Pile one is, you're good. You've got it, you've got a good research question, keep going. Pile two is, you're close, but I need to work with you on a little bit. And pile three is, ooh, you need a lot of help. And that's okay. Because then on Fridays, I could differentiate and say, hey, if you're in this pile, keep going. If you're in this pile, I'm gonna meet with you right now and we're going to clean up these pieces and then you go back to research. Pile three, you and I are going to meet one-on-one -on -one over the course of the next block. So get started, but expect that I'm going to call you or your group over to have a chat to tweak this. 
And that lets everybody keep moving, but differentiate to the different needs. You're not slowing down the kids who are there. You're not, you know, you're pulling them out during their research time, but you're using the time effectively. Cause I know like, hey, you know what? Your project and your project has the same problem. So I'm gonna pull you over together to go through it. And oftentimes too, when students say like, oh, it's not just me. Oh, we both made the same mistake. Okay, revise it, turn it back into me, go back to the computers. So that's research questions, kind of the way that I approach it with students. Thoughts, comments, questions, concerns. So I have a question. So looking at your question here, if we look at the great chicken crossing as the event, mm -hmm. This question would look at what are the events leading up to it. Exactly. Do we want our question to be what are the events leading up to the historic event or what were the effects of the historic event that came after? It depends because there's two ways to approach history. We can look at causation and we can look at impact. Neither one is 100% correct or 100% wrong. Because sometimes students are interested in a current issue and the way we get them into history day is we say, okay, let's go back and look at it. We're gonna argue about, I mean, think about the hot button issues in society today. The kids will come to me and say, I wanna do immigration. Okay, well, if you're gonna understand the political situation of immigration today, we need to go back and we need to look at past groups and past legislation. And if that helps kids understand that gets us up to today, great. So we can look at causes, we can also look at effects. One is not inherently right or inherently wrong. Question. But for National History Day, I mean, isn't a huge part of it proving short and long-term impact, like in terms of like your overall score? Right. Now remember, I'm not necessarily, this isn't necessarily my thesis statement. Okay. This is my question. I see. Okay. I want to know what gets us to this point so that I can say why this event mattered. Okay. Question. Do you, do you kind of create a point of no return, like where they can't change their mind or change their their whole topic or say, I'm, I'm giving up on this, I want to do something else? I think there has to be a window, and it depends on your overall calendar. I would give it about three to four weeks, and after that point, your topic is set. Now, what you do with that topic can change, but if you start flipping every three weeks because you found something new or you saw a movie this weekend that you liked, you're never going to get it done. So is this part, this Framing the research questions, is this helping you in that process? Absolutely. Seeing their level of commitment <laughs> and... If I'm launching you know, this mid-September in my classroom, we're doing this maybe the second week in October. They have enough understanding to write something. And this gives me enough feedback to say, hey, is this topic going to be feasible or is it just not working? So it's an interactive... It has um, to be point in time where you're getting that sense of commitment and exactly. getting them engaged. In exactly. And okay. this to me is not a graded activity because some kids are going to get it on the first try. Some might need two or three versions. Some might need you to sit down and help them craft it. But if you don't have a good question, then moving forward in research, you're just finding stuff. You don't know what you're really looking for or what you need to find. So I think this is one of those important steps. And then if we kind of shift, and I'm gonna throw this out to you. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time reading it. These are the questions that I use with students. Um, for a good research question has certain things. Is it something that I care about? Is it arguable? That's key. Is it unique? What's your spin or your take on the issue? Is it the right size, the Goldilocks rule, right? It's not too big, it's not too small. Can you answer the question with the information you have or can you find the information? And again, I'm gonna share this all out. I'll send it out to you on Tuesday with some other resources. So if we've got a good question, then the thesis statement is the answer to the question. So for those of you who've worked with me, I've done some of my online stuff. You know, I am a huge fan of learning by doing. I'm not gonna to talk to you about it until you try it. So here's your task. I'm gonna give you two minutes. This is independent. Do not look at your neighbor's paper. Do not cheat. That is a cheater move. I want you to write a breaking barriers thesis statement on any topic in history that you want. Don't say a word, look at your paper, two minutes, go. All right, little observation I wanna share, and I want you to share this with your students as well. When I had you share with a partner, I heard at least three of you apologize before you read what you wrote. I want you to break that habit. Because you know what? First draft is exactly that. I gave you two and a half minutes and said, give me two sentences. 
And some of you think Shakespeare should be coming out of your pen. It never does. And we need to get our kids over being afraid to share because nobody's first draft looks great. So what I want to do is give you kind of my tips for a good thesis statement. Now I need to be clear, these are not rules. Rules are limited to things like how tall your exhibit board can be. But these are four tips that I use to test out a thesis and see if I think it's a good one. Now, good rule of thumb, two sentences, three sentences, absolute max. If you go past that, you're getting into your first paragraph. It's not a thesis statement. And also keep in mind, some schools refer to thesis statement, some use claim, some use historical argument. Guess what? It all means the same thing. And it's just depends on which part of the country, which term you use. All right, four things I think a good thesis statement has to do. Number one, it has to clearly state your topic. If I read your thesis statement and then walk away from your exhibit board, do I get the gist of what it's about? Do I know what you're going to study? So what do you think in your thesis statement? Yes or no? Do I have a, do I have your topic? That one's usually good. Most people get that one. Second thing, define your parameters. Are you going to look at the reign of this king from this year to this year? Are you going to look at a certain time period in a decade, a movement? Do we have a sense of a start and an end? Because remember, you can't cover all of history in a history day project, right? So are we looking at a particular century, a particular decade? There's not a hard and fast rule because as a general rule, the further back you go in time, the bigger your time span tends to be, the more recent in time, the shorter your time span tends to be. One's not right or wrong, but I should be able to see what your window is, what you're gonna look at. And that helps because sometimes you have, uh, I love judges, God bless our volunteer judges all over this world, but sometimes they say really stupid things. Like my students who did their product on Warner Brothers in World War II, and the judge said, well, why didn't you do Walt Disney? And it was good because they were able to say, you know, we looked at that, but we decided to set our parameters and look at this piece because of this reason. Third thing, explicit connection to the NHD theme. I want to hear something about a barrier being broken by somebody or something. And I always tell the students, don't assume that the judge can read your mind, right? Judges can't infer what you're thinking. You've got to tell them. And sometimes students think, well, they're going to like be fancy and look up the word barrier and thesaurus and come up with, don't do it. Simple, nail it over the head. This is what I'm arguing. And finally, and this is the hardest one, be an argument and not a statement of fact. So given these four criteria, turn back to your group. Be honest with each other. Did you hit number one? Did you hit number two? Did you hit number three? Did you hit number four? Go. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. All right, let me give you a couple teaching strategies with this. Thesis statements take practice just like research questions. Very few students nail the first one. So some ways to, this is one of my favorite things to do. Have each student or group write their thesis statement on a piece of paper with no names on it. Collect it. You know after a while which kids are doing which topics. Flip them with another class. Give them the four parameters. Let them chew it up. What they'll find is most of the time, kids get one and two, three might be there, four is usually what's missing. And what I would do is I'd flip them with another class, have the kids scribble all over it, and then give it to me. That allowed me, quite frankly, to save a whole lot of grading time because most of the time the students were right. And if they're wrong, I had the ability, they would know I have purple pen. If I crossed it out, that means I disagree with that. But use that because then not only do they get theirs back, this is then something that they have to take the feedback and rewrite. Most students take at least two times. Sometimes students might take four or five times to get it right. And that's okay. This is another one of those tasks that I would either do as an ungraded task or as I call it a zero or 10 task. You get 10 when you nail it. You get a zero until you nail it and you can submit it as many times as you need to to get to that 10. We all know 10 points means nothing in a class, where there might be hundreds or thousands of points, but darn it, 
get the students to get it and revise it till they can get to that end goal, which is something that they can defend. Okay, uh, what I'd like to do then is kind of turn this into a quick little side discussion. What can you do with this to apply this to your students to give their projects a little more structure and a little more success this year? Go ahead, turn to your small groups and then we'll talk as a big group. Here's kind of my goal of today. And for this session and then the one in the afternoon. I always think if I'm gonna go into a workshop, I wanna give you tools. Tools, things that you can specifically put in your tool belt to use, whether it's this week or next month or across the space of the next year. Not every strategy works for everybody, but remember that we still, I don't care if you're dealing with seniors or you're dealing with, with seventh graders, you have to model and practice. Give them examples of a thesis statement. One of the ways that I introduced it with my <laughs> students is I would do uh, about 20 minutes of direct instruction lecture a day out of a 90 minute block. And I would start off by telling them, this is my thesis. This is the argument that I'm gonna make today. And then do my direct instruction. And then I would stop telling it in the beginning and I would give my direct instruction. And I'd say, okay, what was my argument today? And then kind of make them figure it out. And I'd do that for about two weeks. And then we would use that to then get them to write their own. They have to practice. Most kids don't get this on the first time. And that's okay, especially if you're teaching those gifted kids who are used to getting everything perfect, this drives them nuts and it should drive them nuts. And that's okay because we've got to practice and we've got to do in order to be successful. And we have to remind our students that that's okay and that's why we're here. If I'm giving you stuff that you can nail out of the park every day, then I'm not doing a good job as your teacher because you should be struggling to get some of this because that's the only way we get better. When you do something that's easy for you, it's not an accomplishment. It's when you do something that's hard that it's an accomplishment. And that to me, when I taught History Day with my students, they all would tell me throughout the year how much they hated this and it was miserable. And then at the end of the year, when I said, what's the thing you're most proud of? 99 out of 100 kids always wrote it was my project and why and what I learned and how I grew and how one student said specifically you didn't take the first draft and just say it was good you told me what was wrong with it and that's what we want them to do because writing is a developmental process um we'll plug here I teach a writing and editing class in the spring an online class for NHD and I encouraged my teachers to make a bulletin board with it that every when you turn your assignment and you get peer feedback and you turn your assignment in and you get my feedback because I mark your papers, which is so much fun. I want you to show your students. I want you to show your students that the first draft of that thesis statement didn't quite get there, but then you revised it and it did. Because students think that what's in a book is the first draft and that people who are good writers get it the first time. And as the person who does a whole lot of writing and editing for National History Day, I can guarantee you the first draft is never the one that ends up in the publication. Questions on any of that, and if not, I'm going to do a couple plugs. Fun Does stuff coming up. Natural, National History Day, is it open to sixth graders as well? Yes. Okay. And is some states have the, uh, the youth or apprentice divisions, which includes fourth and fifth graders, mm -hmm. and they have that in New Mexico. Now, fourth and fifth graders do not advance up to the national level, and every state has different rules or regulations. Some only do certain categories. I know in California, they just do posters. Some allow it for all. So I, I'm going to defer to Ellen to tell you exactly what they do here. But a, what I think the value of having that fourth, fifth grade division, it's one thing to do your project and present it. It's even more important to go to the contests, whether it's the regional or the state level, and go to see what the middle school kids and the high school kids are doing. Because oftentimes that can be an awful lot of inspiration to some of our younger students. And it gives them some ideas of what is possible. To me, the best part of a History Day contest is when kids come out and be like, I really want to do that next year. Or did you see that documentary or that performance? That was so cool. Because they didn't just learn about the one that they did, they learned about what they saw. And please, if you take kids to contest, get them to see as many projects as you can. All right, yes. Can I just ask you to clarify what you had said originally about, did you say you talked to the kids that day and then have them develop a thesis statement based on what you presented? Right, so think about it as a 20 minute lecture. So I wanna talk about um, Northern colonies versus Southern colonies. And I'm gonna have a thesis in here, but I'm not gonna explicitly tell you what it is. 
But I waited at the end. I said, okay, what, what was I really talking about? What were the barriers that were being broken in the economic exchanges, let's say with the um, triangle trade? And I help them. So I start with telling them what I'm going to argue. And then I take that piece away and say, okay, you tell me what I argued. And it, it takes a couple, it takes about two weeks of practicing it every day. Once you do that though, they get pretty darn good at it. And I would get to the point where I'd have it like written at the top of my notes and they could write down something that was pretty darn close. Because I'm modeling what I want them to do. I'm not just in my direct instruction telling them George Washington was the first president and he passed these laws and did these things. I'm making a case as to why that was important and how it plays out later. But I just shift from structuring it for them to giving them the fact without the structure and making them figure out the structure. And they get it. They get it a whole lot faster than you think you did. The first time I did it, I thought it was going to take me a month. Especially because like the first day was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand your question. This is impossible. I want to quit this class. <laughs> Once you get over that hurdle of saying, get over it, you might not get it on the first day. We'll work through it together. And each day I'd give a little less of prompting and a little less support to the last day. You know what? I'm giving y'all five minutes as a class to figure it out. I'm going to walk out in the hallway for five minutes and let them discuss. And then I'd come back in and you'd be awful surprised what they can do when they stop relying on you. Question, go ahead. Nothing, I've never met. Okay. Well, here's the game. I'm gonna give a couple plugs. I'm gonna be here for lunch, be here all day. Ask me all kinds of questions too. Um, go ahead. Is there, like, I know that there's a structure to the judging and I'm totally new to this, but if the kids did, I mean, once they've got a thesis, which keeps them from being all over the map, is there a place for like interesting side facts or like if there is something that they go, whoa, I never knew this, that they like surprise elements? Well, I always tell students that whatever goes on your final project, so your documentary, your exhibit, your website, whatever, should tie back to your argument. If not, you end up with like what I call a kitchen sink project, where it's like, here's everything I found about Elizabeth Cady Stanton and isn't this cool, and she was the log cabin in which she was born. True, but relevant. And I think kids get really obsessed with this, you know, the names of their mother and father. Accurate, but does it matter? And that's part of the historical research process of learning a lot and then saying, okay, this is what I need to know. This is what matters. This is what shows not just who her mother was, but what she did that mattered in history. And that's where we're trying to take them. Now, obviously, as students get older, the projects get better because a sixth grade project should not look like an 11th grade project. The only thing that should be in common with them is the size. And you have to adapt this to the needs of your learners. So I've seen some that are done by students, let's say with Down syndrome or other intellectual disabilities, and they might have a do you know panel. Is that appropriate for that student? Absolutely. Is that appropriate in a 12th grade advanced project? I would argue no, but it all depends on the needs of your students and meeting them where they are and pushing them a little further. All right, a couple quick things and we'll, oh, well I'm already off time to go. You know, I'll do my shameless plugs this afternoon of some cool stuff that's coming. Uh, we're doing some really neat stuff with World War I, and I'll show you some cool resources that we have that are coming that you can use and access some World War I stuff, some World War II stuff, and two hints of things that are coming hopefully in October. Opportunities for Teachers for Summer 2020. So, I'm over time. I don't believe in going over time because lunch matters. We're going to grab some lunch. I'll be back here. I'm going to do 10 strategies for reaching reluctant writers this afternoon. So thank y'all for coming out and spending a beautiful Saturday here. Enjoy your lunch, and I'll be there so you can ask whatever questions you didn't get to ask yet. Thank you. Thank you.